Well, let me start by, I really want to thank Matthew for inviting me here. I mean, uh, you guys have been at this project for a while. I'm a total outsider, just came in, and I really enjoyed it. I mean, I learned a lot listening to everyone, and I enjoyed meeting people and hanging out with people, even Joe. So, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> This is where the pointer comes in. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, uh, I'm, I'm going to do something slightly different. I mean, Matthew was saying uh, it's going to be normative, but uh, you know, I mean, a lot of the things this morning definitely really fitted well together. So this is going to be a little bit of a different thing. I actually had expected. I thought when I saw the program, I said Matt has been very clever. And you know, giving people the option to just have a sandwich and leave. Uh, but clearly, people haven't quite gotten that scenario yet. So, anyway, stick, thanks for sticking around. So, I will be talking about BISC income, and I'll explain a bit about what that is. I just wanted to say so, that is officially, although I'm presenting it and I kind of pulled this one together, it's part of a project with a guy called Simon Birnbaum, who's a philosopher from Stockholm University. Uh, and I'm sort of applying part of that project to the precariousness thing. That project itself is not about the precarious, but we're kind of trying to fit it in. And Simon and I, we sort of have a distribution of labor where all the good ideas are mine and anything that's dodgy. And that sounds really implausible. That's basically his, right? So as long as we get that straight, then we're good. Um, so maybe before I get into the paper, just a couple of words about basic income. I mean, until like five years ago, basic income was one of these things that the odd person had heard about, but not very much. And then suddenly things went totally crazy. So 2013, we had this referendum, uh, you know, or the Citizens Initiative in Switzerland. And that came totally into the news. So many people may have seen some of these images. They had this sort of amazing campaign with, you know, dumping a load of a little coins onto the square, and you know they made like the world's largest um, uh, poster all about basic income, an amazing campaign that really brought the media attention and then afterwards the policy attention. Now, the referendum itself got voted down, as everyone expected basically, but we already had a big win because now suddenly everyone talks about basic income. And then we had the experiments going, so Finland, the Finnish government, about a year and a bit ago, started talking about, OK, we want to do this experiment. And it actually started this week. So it's the first country that is going to experiment with a basic income nationwide. Right? But in addition to Finland, you know, Holland is talking about it. Uh, Canada is talking about it. And some of you may have seen the news even yesterday. So again, Glasgow was in the news. So it may well be that up in Scotland, things are going to move quite fast. So there's a lot of attention about this basic income. But that said, um, you know, people hear a lot about it, but I still find when I talk about basic income to people that people are sometimes a little bit confused what it is. So let me just be very, very clear. So basic income is the idea that we give every citizen or permanent resident. It can be, you know, there's a little debate around that. But as a citizen right, so to speak, we give every individual person a basic grant, so to speak, a monthly income which is totally unconditional. It's unconditional on any work requirement. It's unconditional on means test. So you know, you give it to the rich, you give it to the poor. And it's also unconditional on the use. So nothing like vouchers or any of that sort of nonsense. It's cash that you can use the way you like without any conditions, okay? And it's individual, as I said. So a lot of policies are family-based. This is different. So the idea is, as a citizenship right, everyone gets that basic floor and then on top of that, there's lots of other stuff happening, right? You know, it could be part of benefits, it could be wages, it could be, you name it, right? So, but the idea is we have this floor underneath. Very utopian kind of policy, as many people thought, but as we see now, a lot of governments are being very interested in it, okay? I'm not gonna say anything more about experiments, which is what I usually talk about. I'm also not gonna say much more about the whole politics thing, which is very complicated, is also another thing I usually talk about. What I actually want to talk about is a very specific type of argument that's often put forward to say that basic income is a very, very good idea. And this is the argument that basic income allows you to basically quit crap jobs, to exit, right? 
or to negotiate with your employer for better jobs, right? And I want to drag this into, or you know, I want to associate this with the debate around precariousness and precarity. And of course, that brings us to guy standing. So guy standing, if you think precariousness and you think basic income, guy standing is the one person, of course, comes to mind right away. He's written a bunch of books and a couple of articles on this. And he's been pushing the idea that, well, we have this sort of separate class or class in the making, as he calls it, which is called the precariat. And he thinks that one of the things we should be doing in order to you know, help these people out, so to speak, is put a basic income in place. Okay? And I'm going to take at least some critical perspectives on some of these ideas. Um, I, I sort of have a few slides about the guy standing idea of precariousness and precariat. And I'm sort of not, I, in a way, I don't necessarily want to go too much into it. Um, but having said that, I mean, it, it did strike me a bit as we were, you know, we had two days of talking about precariousness. And there was sort of a lot of sort of assuming that we all know what that is and what that means. And actually, I mean, me personally, I haven't figured it out yet, right? So, so and as I'm going through a lot of the literature, you know, there seems to be many, many different things that precariousness could mean. So on the one hand, we kind of have this idea of precariousness as something like a condition, as in, you know, um, you were talking about diversity and uncertainty. And in some sense, that captures it. So it's all about risk shifts. It's all about insecurity. You know, and obviously, you know, it's about being uncertain about stuff that's really bad for you in that sort of obvious way. But then Guy Standing talks about it in a different way. He really thinks that this is a very specific group. This is a class, what he calls a class in the making. And that, that term in itself has generates a big debate, right? So there's a lot of people who disagree with Guy that this is a proper class, that it really can be looked at it that way. But what his idea is that we have, you know, following on from neoliberalism in the 80s, we've had these fundamental shifts in the labor market that somehow have separated out different people's, you know, sort of structural positions in the labor market, if you like. And the precariat is one of those groups, and these are the ones that face all these insecure conditions. So these are the people who you know, go from one contract to another contract, go from job to unemployment, back into job, and so on and so forth. Lots of that stuff, they spend a lot of time, so to speak, you know, applying for jobs, applying for benefits in between, trying to find their way around. They're very powerless, you know. Usually these are jobs with, you know, um, very low pay, no security attached to it, no, you know, entitlements to benefits, and so on, all the sort of supplementary stuff that we think about when we think about a stable job. The precariat is missing out on all that, right? So now, you know, if you want to sort of, Guy Standing has written like hundreds of pages, so to speak, about all different aspects of that. And we could get into that, but I think the bit here, living through insecure jobs, and then tying it into insecure lives, is kind of what he wants to capture. And there's actually a little bit, um, oh, where's my, there you go, I can use this. There you go, access to housing. Huh? That's what these guys were talking about. It's actually in there. So they weren't just making this up. I mean, the guy standing is really talking about this sort of stuff. So, so there's a lot of interesting stuff going on about, you know, and, and there's a big debate about, you know, what is this precariat really and who is part of that? And, you know, he has sort of, he talks about, you know, it's partly young people, it's partly old people getting back into it because, you know, supplementing pensions and so on and so forth. It's women, for example, being a lot more precarious and so on and so forth. It's what he called denizens, but, you know, like migrants. Migrant workers in all sorts of ways. But it's also, you know, people like myself, for example. I mean, I am one of these people. I'm highly skilled, you know, at least insofar as a PhD counts as highly skilled. <laughs> uh, you know, and I go from one contract to another. And as I've said, you know, I've explained to several people here, I mean, I live in England and I work in Finland. And then people say, isn't that a difficult commute and a hard life? Uh, duh, yeah. <laughs> you know? So, so, but this is the sort of stuff that Guy Standing talks about when he thinks about one of the traps, the precarity traps, is this time squeeze. I mean, you end up being part of a labor market, but you end up spending a lot of time, you know, getting round to doing the sort of jobs. Whereas if you had a stable job that puts you very well located in one position, you're saving a lot of time on this. So time squeeze is one of the big problems that he identifies, and rightly so, 
in terms of what makes the prokaryote sort of, you know, a vulnerable position. And the other big one, and of course that ties into the basic income thing, is precarious income, right? It's the fact that, you know, well, one, you may have a low income, but more importantly than that, or more worrisome than that, is you may not know, you know, what your income will be a month from now, six months from now, a year from now, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of fluctuations, there's a lot of uncertainty. So that is the key component. Now, Guy Standing talks about loads of other things. He also talks about issues around identity and so on and so forth. And you know, there's, so there's a lot more going on in this whole analysis. But I want to kind of leave it at this because this idea of the precariat having a distinctive structure of income fits in very nicely with basic income, which, as the name says, is about income, right? And when, when Guy Standing talks about you know, what he refers to as social income, he basically thinks of it in terms of you know, when people's social income can come from multiple sources. Wages is an obvious one, but there's a lot of benefits. And by the way, benefits is not just social assistance, right? There's middle class people and rich people get a lot of benefits from the state, right? So there's a lot of assistance that's basically targeted towards you know, people who have very stable jobs, very well off, and so on. You know, housing allowances, tax deductions, you name it, right? A lot of that stuff comes into it. Um, community support could be part of that. Issues, you know, whatever. You have assets, you have wealth, you get income from that, effectively. You know, all these sort of things. Guy Standing's point is that the precariat actually only has one thing, namely this is the wages, and the wages are insecure, right? Because these people usually are sort of partly excluded from benefits. So think about this in terms of, you know, you, you may be in a contractual job. You then have to apply for benefits. There's going to be a waiting time. You know, stuff can happen. There might be another contract going on. You may not be entitled to various forms of assistance and so on and so forth, right? There might be issues around community support. You know, you might lose out community support because, say, for example, someone like me, I travel all the time. You know, so I move from one country to another. It means support networks, effectively, you know, are being dislocated in a way. So issues around that is a problem. So precariat relying on, you know, wages, very insecure, very insecure social income. And then the idea, of course, would be that a basic income would be a solution to that. And that's partly what I want to talk about. So, so when I... When I think, so there's various ways we can actually think about sort of why a basic income would be a good thing. So many people sort of talk about the big picture. They think that basic income sort of represents this idea of, you know, think about citizenship rights, think about T.H. Marshall, you know, social rights, that sort of stuff. Think about the idea that we're, you know, we've gone down the road of like, you know, decades and decades of sort of increasing activation and now there's austerity and it, it pushes so many people into poverty and into dissolution, deprivation, and so on and so forth. So, you know, many people think that's just not the way a civilization, a civilized state should deal with its citizens, right? So there's a lot of big picture issues around it. There's, you know, theories of justice, philosophical theories of justice, talking about this stuff all the time. So there's another way to think about basic income, and that is actually to think about this in terms of actual groups in society. So think, for example, about the disabled, the young, single parents, you know, pensioners, you name it. We can identify different groups and we could actually then see what is it that a basic income could do for these specific groups. So a lot of what I do and what I'm interested in is going down that road. And one of the reasons is because, you know, we, we, the big picture stuff was all really, really interesting and especially when we were still talking about basic income as, you know, an alternative idea, utopia and so on and so forth. But now governments are interested, a lot of stakeholders are interested. We need to think about policy properly in, you know, in a much more detailed sense. And that means actually looking what it is that basic income can do for specific groups. And here is sort of a caveat. I am, I am really, really interested. I think the idea of basic income is great. It's really interesting. I think it's absolutely necessary to have that as a counter narrative to the sort of banging on austerity, activation, yada, 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 you know, all the all the idea of having social rights as citizens and so on, I think as a narrative is hugely, hugely important. But when we get down to see what a basic income can actually do, we also need to be very, very 
taking hard looks at the actual mechanisms and not try and overshoot, in a sense, what this is capable of as a policy. Because it's dangerous, right? I mean, if we come up with all these arguments, say basic income is going to be great for this and great for that and great for this, and then we either trial it or we test it or we implement it and it turns out not to be the case, then we have a problem. So we, know, we want to be very concrete about this. So if we then focus on one particular area where basic income could have an impact, and it could be the labor market, the precarious labor market, if you like. So here are several issues that you could think about in terms of basic income. You know, we can think about alleviating income when you become unemployed, either complement or replacement of unemployment insurance. It's about easing transitions into the labor market. These are the famous unemployment traps or, you know, transitions within the labor market, moving from one job to another, perhaps taking on a part-time job and so on. So it's supposed to make all these things much easier. Sorry. It's supposed to make human capital development easier, make it easier for people to reskill themselves, keep their skills up, and so on and so forth, which, of course, is a very important way these days to get more employment security. And then there's the two points that I really want to talk about today which is, on the one hand, the idea that we can leave the meaning jobs, i.e. we can exit. This is like, you know, tell your boss to shove it, so to speak, you know? Like, you're giving me a crap job, I'm just not having it. I'll take my basic income, thanks very much. And then the last one is the idea that, well, if we have this exit thing, we can also bargain. So you tell your job, say, well, you know, not just shove it, but you know, why don't you just give me a better offer? Give me an offer you can't, that, give me an offer I can't refuse and I won't refuse. That kind of thing, right? And those, I think, so, so my sort of general idea is I think basic income can do a lot of really interesting things in and around the labor market. But I have questions about whether these last two are really going to happen. And here's the important bit. So this is the exit option thing again. We actually find these arguments in quite a lot of the basic income debate. So for example, you know, so, so when I think about the exit option, I take these two together. The first one is the freedom to exit this demeaning job workplace. The second one is the power to bargain. And the power to bargain, of course, is associated with the fact that you can threaten your boss to leave, right? And these things are really quite important in the basic income discussion. They're often put forward. Um, you know, Carl Weiderquist, who is sort of one of the big names, if, if, you've read, if you've read interviews somewhere, you probably have come across him. He is the co-chair of the International Basic Income Network, and he's like the chair of sort of huge amounts of other networks and so on. But he has this sort of phrase where he says, a basic income gives people the power to say no. And it's a very catchy phrase, right? You know, so it's, so it's been picked up everywhere. You know, it's being used every, you know, I mean, I've seen a lot of TEDx kind of talks where they keep saying, yeah, it's important because it allows us to say no, you know, and that's great, right? We're talking about people who are very vulnerable, disadvantaged, excluded, and we give them the power to say no. So it kind of makes sense. It's very appealing, intuitively very appealing to me as well. And associated with that, the power to bargain, it's great. So we're talking about reinstalling a power balance, if you like. Precariat being very powerless, basic income supposedly being able to do that through this exit option, right? That's the question in a sense. That's, that's kind of the thing that I'm interested in. But then my question is, how is this supposed to work, really? And is it going to work? And to kind of, you know, to do like a little Hitchcock, I'm already going to tell you who the bad guys are, so to speak in advance. I think it doesn't quite work as well as these people are saying. I think it's a case where we have a very intuitively appealing argument, but that's kind of run at a level of, you know, generality, if you like. It's running at the sort of the bigger picture kind of framework, and it sounds great, but if you actually start thinking about the mechanisms specifically, I think it doesn't quite work as well. So. A um, little aside, what do we actually mean by exit? So, so here are three ways to think about exit. The first one is what we call weak or incomplete exit. So this is the, you know, putting my philosopher hat on, analytical distinctions. Philosophers love distinctions. You know, ideally, they do some work, and I hope these do some work. 
but many philosophers just make distinctions for the sake of making distinctions. So there's a bit of that. So the weak exit is about withdrawing from a job, either temporarily or partially, but nevertheless having this continued strong link to the labor market. Okay? And I'm actually going to set that one aside, the weak one. I mean, there's a lot of interesting stuff basic income can do there. There's a lot of interesting things to say about it. But it's not the thing that I'm mostly interested in. I'm mostly interested in two other ones. And the two other ones are what we call strong exit. And strong exit is where I want to move from one job to another. But I want to be in the labor market, right? It's a very important point. And it's different from what we call radical exit, because radical exit are the people who say, look, this whole labor market business is not for me. I'm going to do something else. And that something else can be a lot of very useful stuff. It could be volunteering. It could be taking care of your children, your parents, you name it, right? So I'm not saying that this is in any way a bad choice. I'm just making the distinction. And the distinction is important. Not everyone who quits a job wants to leave the labor market, right? And if we don't have that distinction, and unfortunately, the people promoting this exit argument, they often don't make that distinction. They basically say, you know, it's important to say no to your boss. But for me, and for Simon and me, it matters whether that means saying no to your boss and picking up another job, or saying no to your boss and leaving altogether. Two very different conditions, right? And very important in what will follow. So by the way, here's Guy standing again. Just a very quick note. This is sort of Guy's view on Biscayne or you know, a little piece where he actually sort of affirms this, right? He basically says, you know, a Biscayne would give people a greater capacity to live outside the market. You know, that's the radical one. Allowing people to move in and out of the labor market more, that's partly the strong one. But you see, you know, he kind of puts these together in one big quote. So we see this a lot. You go through the literature, so to speak, you see people making these claims as if they're the same, more or less, right? So then the question, first question, do we really have a sort of basic income-based exit option? So if you are in the precariat, if you are in that particular vulnerable part of the labor market, and you are given a basic income, can you exit? Or is that something that has limitations? And here at this point, I mean, one of the obvious things that many people, when I talk about this stuff, they say, well, but what are we talking about with a basic income here? And you know, how high is it and so on and so forth? And of course, that's very relevant. I mean, if you get a basic income of whatever, you know, 1,000 euros or pounds a month, it's going to be very different than 500 and 200. So it is very, very relevant, right? But in some sense, I kind of want to make some general arguments here and see how far I can take those. And partly this is because the debate about how much a basic income is is kind of a separate debate. But to be fair, every plausible scheme that we are seeing is you know, a quite low basic income, right? So, so although a lot of these people advocating this are talking about a basic income that allows you to live on your own kind of sort of thing, that's not exactly on the books at the moment, right? I mean, that's not all these governments who are now interested in considering basic income, that's not what they have in mind. They have in mind something that's a lot lower and that has to be supplemented with other types of schemes, right? So that's effectively what I have in the background when I go to this. So why do I think, so I think exit options are problematic, right? So why do I think they're problematic? Well, first of all, the whole idea that a basic income allows you exit focuses very, very much on the income component. And let's be real, I mean, when people make decisions about how to work, where to work, whether to move and so on and so forth, income is one consideration. It's an important one, but it's not the only one. There's a lot of things happening when you have a job that a basic income cannot replace, right? I mean, you can argue that a basic income is a very good thing and does a lot of work, but it's still about income, and there's still a lot of other things going on. And you don't have to go gung-ho about job is the most important thing. I'm not saying that, right? I'm not saying anything about how important the job is and everyone should work and so on and so forth. I'm just saying that if you have a job, you might be getting more out of it than just the income. And that's going to feature into your sort of calculation of whether you're going to do this or not, right? 
And some of these things are ish things that you get out of the job yourself, you know, whether it's hanging out with your mates, uh, you know, your sense of identity, all these sort of things. I mean, you know, you all know about this, right? There's whole literature about this. But a lot of it is also tied in, for example, with where that job is located. So, you know, I mentioned this already. I mean, I moved from Finland to England to Canada to Barcelona, whatever. Every time and again, I need to break up a network, find a new social network. I mean, imagine that you have to do this with kids. You need to you know, look at new schools and so on and so forth. I mean, those are real considerations. They're serious constraints, right? So very obviously, simply thinking basic income is going to do all this is ignoring a hell of a lot of what comes into people's decisions. First problem. So second problem is that these, these exit costs are not equally distributed. So you know, people within the precariat, the precariat is a very heterogeneous group. They're young people and old people and women and women with children, single or not, right? And now some men as well, part of it, and so on and so forth. But each of these different people, different groups, face different types of social context, face different sort of costs. So the idea, yes, we have a universal basic income. Everyone gets the same, but it's not giving you the same exit option. Because a lot of it depends on what happens in the rest of your life, right? And I think this is an important aspect. So if these people make the argument that basic income is great because it gives you the power to say no, then my response to that is, well, one, I want to see how that really pans out in your life. And two, I want to be very careful about generalizing this across all these different groups, these different individuals that make up the precariat. Right? I think we need to be very, very much more careful. We need to look at much more detail. Quite a different issue then. If you are a strong exit person, basically that means you are a person who is in a crappy job situation. You want to tell your boss to shove it, but you want to go to another job. That assumes that there is another job. And it assumes that that other job is a better job. Right? So what is the biggest problem? If you look even at Guy Standing's analysis, you know, I mean, if he is right, and other people are arguing along the same lines, that the precariat is about structural features of the labor market. Then, you know, I mean, these people are trapped in a structure which means that they move quite easily horizontally, right? Which means going from one crappy job to another crappy job and so on and so forth. Not that easy to move upwards, right? One of the biggest problems with the precariat is that they are trapped in this particular issue. So what is it that the basic income is going to do? If a basic income does allow you to tell your boss, leave it, but your next job is basically similar enough. I mean, okay, you know, you know if, you're, if, if you just happen to be in a situation where your boss, as an individual, is a, this is being taped, right? Is a total arsehole, I'm gonna say it anyway, because it's the only way to say it, then sure, that's nice, but there's no guarantee that the next one will be a nice fella. And if it happens to be a nice fella and it solves your problem, great. But that's not what we're talking about when we talk about policy level kind of sort of interventions, right? So, so there's a real issue, you know? So in that sense, if that is the situation, the structural situation, then you know this exit option generated by basic income may not just be that much of a real thing. And then there's a further problem. It may well be that you end up giving up on that job and you risk sliding into the radical exit thing i.e. you risk sliding into a situation where you're actually more and more out of the labor market. So here is one thing. People like Guy Standing and this Carl Weidegrist, they genuinely believe that that is a good thing. They believe that we're too much focused on work, on formal work, employment. They think that people should have loads of opportunities outside of the labor market. All that is fine. You know? And for many people, that might work. Right? I mean, they take examples about you know, artists and musicians, but not everyone is a musician. Not everyone is an artist. Not everyone wants to spend the time somewhere uh, in order to take care of the children. Perhaps we want to take off some time to do that. But at some point, we want to have our career. We want to do this. So, so here is the really interesting thing. I mean, uh, people like Guy Standing are always talking about you know, where we have to be anti-paternalistic. But anti-paternalistic also means listening to people. And if these people basically say, look, I want to shove this job, but I do want to get a proper job, then we should perhaps respect that. 
So to then say, well, you know, you're actually going to slide out of the labor market, but it's really good for you. I mean, you know, I find that a bit weird. So, you know, if basic income is supposed to give you the sort of freedom, then it should actually respect that decision, the distinction between the people who want to move between jobs, stay in the labor market, and the people who want to move out of it. Right? Okay? And so there is a genuine risk, I think. I mean, it's a genuine risk for the precariat that people who take up their basic income and say, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go six months out of the labor market, and you know, I'm going to take my time. I need to recover from my crappy job. Even if that were possible, what is to say what's going to happen next? Right? So that's a serious problem. So what about bargaining power? So that's the next step. So what I've argued now is that there are at least some constraints about thinking that exit is such an obvious thing for the precariat. So what about a bargaining power? What about telling your, your boss, you know, if, if you're not giving me these better conditions, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go, basically. So, well, you know, we need to be very careful about that. You know, so one of the arguments that we often find, and I'm sure you've come across this, is that, you know, apparently the robots are all going to steal our jobs now. You know? And of course, again, huge debates about whether that's going to happen or not. It's not the first time, by the way, we've had this debate, right? I mean, the people who are now pushing this you know, seem to forget that. We've kind of had this debate 25 years ago and then <laughs> a bit earlier and so on and so forth. I'm not saying it's not going to happen. Clearly, things are going to change. But the extent to which that means that all the jobs are going to be gone, I mean, I, you know, I'll leave that up to other people to decide. But I'd say let's be a bit careful about this, right? But imagine that this does happen. I mean, if technological unemployment is an issue, I would imagine that in the precariat, a lot of these people would be affected by it. And if that is the thing, if basically, you know, employers have the technological means to replace you with robot capacity, robot labor power, that's not much of a threat, right? If you go to your boss, and say, you know, we're all going to leave here unless you give us better conditions. And boss says, well, actually, you know, that'd be really, really great because I can replace you all very nice with a couple of robots and I'll do all the jobs. You know? I mean, think about Amazon, right? I mean, think about the Amazon workers pushing for higher wages and better conditions. And they're saying, actually, you know, we'd love it if you guys all go, you know, just go away, do your thing, enjoy your basic income. We'll have a couple of robots. They'll sort us all out. It'll be cheaper. Great, you know, not much of a threat. 30 so, sorry? 30 minutes. 30 minutes, great. Uh, I'll take another 10 and I'll be right. So, but even if it's without the robots, I mean, you know, so one of the biggest problems at the moment is the way the labor market is. So forget the robots for a moment, the way the labor market is as an individual, you know, you don't really have much of a threat when you're in the precariat because there's loads of other people in the precariat very happily taking up your job because everyone is scrambling for those contracts, right? That is the reality of it. So how much of a threat is an individual basic income? And I emphasize individual here because one of the biggest problems I see, and to some extent Guy, St Guy Standing is a bit ambivalent because he, he does sort of, you know, take into account a lot more of the collective kind of dimension. But a lot of these people who push for this exit thing, like Carl Weidekwist, they think of this in very individual terms. You know, I mean, they're quasi-libertarians, if you like it. They really think that, you know, my freedom is my basic income and things like that. And it's all independent. But, you know, for a precariat in that sense, I mean, to me, it just doesn't work much. So again, you know, you go to your boss or Amazon, whatever, and say, look, you know, I really want the proper you know, I want a proper contract and proper conditions and access to this and so on and so forth. Oh, I'll go somewhere else. You know, again, they're going to say, well, bye-bye. And, you know, there are plenty of people willing to work under these conditions, so no worries. Okay? So if it's the case that precariat, which, you know, a lot of them are low-skilled and low-training, not all of them. There are, you know, the cases of the high-skilled ones in precariat like myself and so on. That's a separate case, although, you know, any academic job you apply for, there's three, four hundred people and so on and so forth. So, you know, we're in the same situation there, right? But if you talk, think about precariat and sort of the standard kind of stuff, you know, people with problems getting upskilled and so on and so forth, they're very easily replaced by other workers or by technology. And, you know, and if that is the case, if either of these situations plays a role, 
then as far as bargaining position goes, we're again in a serious problem, right? So we have an exit problem, we have a bargaining problem. It's not going to really work that well. So there's actually an extra worry on the bargaining issue because there might be a sense in which we're actually eating into the sort of collective dimension <laughs> because you know, there might be a sense in which we're pitching precarious workers against each other through this basic income thing, you know? I mean, imagine workers basically saying, look, you know, I'm going to, I want to bargain for my better conditions. Basic income allows me this. Boss then says, well, that's okay, I'll just hire someone else. I mean, effectively what you're doing is you're eating into the sort of whatever solidarity is in the precariat. And keep in mind that the precariat is a very heterogeneous group for starters, you know? So one of the things that is already a problem with the class in the making is that there's so many very different people. They don't necessarily have the easy conditions where you can really build sort of collective identity, collective strategies, collective action, and so on and so forth. So, so that's already a problem. And then in some sense, we're gonna start pitching into this. So again, that goes back to the fact that, you know, a lot of this exit strategy is individual. And one of the things that Simon and I think is we need to really start thinking collective a lot more, which of course is partly going back to some of the sort of strategies that someone like Guy Standing think is part of the old world that we should drop, right? It gets us back to trade unions and so on and so forth as well, right? So, so, so here is something, and you know, I'm kind of putting this out as an idea. Might it be that basic income can actually get us into a precarity paradox? And the precarity paradox is the following. The people for who this exit would be most important, those who are most vulnerable within the precariat, right? And as precariat, the, for sure, within the sort of whole labor market or with, with other, the other groups, the basic income actually might generate the least valuable option. Why? because of the reasons I mentioned before. You know, they, the bargaining position is not really there. Some of these people may have other sorts of attachment that make it really, really hard to exit in the first place. So this kind of gets us from precarity to equality in some sense, right? So this is about if we're really sure that this basic income is supposed to help people, we want to make sure that it helps the most vulnerable, the most disadvantaged, okay? And of course, it may help them in various other ways. I mean, if, you know, if these people are kicked out of a job, you know, I'm not saying that the basic income is not going to have a positive impact, right? I mean, the income security thing, even at that low level, is going to be important. But what I'm saying is, as an exit strategy and as a bargaining strategy, that's not going to work, right? So, so let's be very, very clear what the argument is trying to do and what it isn't trying to do, right? And I think there's a genuine paradox here, you know? So I want to say one kind of last point. So let's think for a moment about this idea of transformational agency. So one of the implications of Guy, or one of the things that Guy has been working on in the more recent book is this idea that, well, we have this class in the making. And then that class is sort of becoming the agent of, you know, the new world, so to speak, right? So, so you know, somehow the precarious, the precariat itself, by virtue of a whole bunch of supporting policies, including this kingdom, is supposed to transform itself and the world into, you know, a better place. So how is that helping, or, or what, what can we say about that? So, so I have just a, a whole bunch of questions on this, right? So the first question I actually have is, what actually is the goal? Are we changing precariousness? Are we changing, you know, in some sense, the quality of these people's lives and their experiences in terms of, you know, the insecurities and so on and so forth? Or are we actually transforming the precariat? So, so is it about getting yourself out of the precariat as a group and somewhere else? Or is it about, you know, the precariat disappearing. I'm very, very unclear, and perhaps other people know anything about it. I'm very, very unclear what someone like Guy Standing would think about that, right? Uh, you know, I mean, if on the one hand, precariat really is this big agent kind of thing, it seems that almost, you know, it's like it has to stay in place, and somehow the precariat becomes, you know, it becomes a set of people, a group, that somehow can still get a good life. You know, so that's when we change precariousness. But the moment we do this, are we still talking about a precariat? So this is how, you know, 
how all these conditions fit into the structural constraints and so on and so forth. I'm, I'm quite really, really very clear that if we have to transform the world, what it is exactly that we're aiming at. There's another issue, and uh, you know, there's, um, I'm, I'm not sure whether he's French, actually, Marcel Paret, I, or Parrot, I don't know whether it's French or English. But uh, in one of the comments on Guy Stanning's work, he actually makes the, what I thought was very astute observation that Guy Stanning is always talking to him again about sort of, you know, paternalism and anti-paternalism and agency and so on and so forth. But effectively, he's not really trusting to Precaria to be their own agents. Instead, he basically says, look, me as a sort of elite thinker, I'm going to propose a whole bunch of policies that will help you. Basic income will be good for you. And you know, and actually life outside the labor market will be good for you. It's great. You know, you should appreciate this. You should, you know, take out your false consciousness. You know, you've been indoctrinated about this whole work stuff and so on and so forth. And there's a lot more of that going on. Now, if you really think that precariat should be their own agent, then, you know, in some sense, you might want to actually propose a couple of other things. So there's some weird things going on. Another issue is something I've mentioned before, the fact that as a class, as a group, the precariat really is too heterogeneous, right? If we are thinking about transformational agency, we need to think about groups that can be organized, have strategies, have a collective identity, can really, really work together. And that's easier said than done. And I mean, and the people here who work with communities know this much better, right? So it's really, really hard to get people into the same place involved and so on and so forth. You know, the, the examples that Valdemar was giving, I mean, and that's in a simple village. I mean, imagine trying to do this, you know, at the level of labor markets in places that are so diverse, right? And people are moving around. Keep in mind the precariat moves in a job and out a job and in a job and out a job. I mean, these are serious issues. It's hard to organize, right? And they have different interests, right? I mean, some of these, and, and Guy Standing, for example, recognizes this. He says that, you know, there's the people who like were bumped out of the proletariat, and then there's sort of the other people who somehow were more enlightened because they're, you know, they, they have different views about work. But those are radically opposing interests, right? You know, and let alone the fact that, you know, again, we're talking about, you know, men and women and people with children and not and the old and the young. And to simply assume that because we're all sort of facing insecurity as a condition, you know, it seems odd to think that that's going to bring us all together. In reality, that's not really what's happening. I mean, you know, you're going to need more. You're going to need to resolve that identity and that, that you know, group interest and that group sort of strategy sort of thing. And it's, it's not that obvious to me. And I guess the final point there then is like, even if you could overcome all these problems, I mean, so what is it that basic income is supposed to be doing there? So the exit option is problematic. So those of you who may have read sort of a Hirschman's classic, which was like exit voice and loyalty. Yeah, exit voice loyalty, yeah. That's 1970s, right? But, but he made the most, you know, one of the important points he made was that voice, which is all about collective action and collective, you know, engagement gets hollowed out, gets crowded out by exit. Why? Because you have a group of people who want to organize. And if some of these people have exit options, they go away. It just means that you're left with a smaller group, right? So, I mean, to the extent that a lot of collective action is strength in numbers, exit clearly creates a problem, right? So if we think basic income through exit as a mechanism, it turns out that that could actually be competing the very other strategy that we might have, namely the usual sort of collective action kind of thing. And even if we could overcome that, even if we could think about solidarity and so on and so forth, what is that basic income is still doing? So Guy Standing again, he has basic income as one amongst a whole host of different measures. But then the question is, what is it that basic income is really doing? Is it still doing any work on this? Or is it actually the other stuff that's doing a lot of the work? You know? It's one thing that people say, well, basic income shouldn't be doing everything. You know, we have other stuff as well. Actually, I'm saying it the other way around. Perhaps it's the other stuff doing all the work and the basic income is a bit tagged on to it. You know, so, so we need to know this. And by the way, solidarity and basic income, this is an important point actually, People have this idea, because it's universal, everyone gets it, we're going to create solidarity. But that's rubbish. That's not going to happen, you know? 
I mean, think about your pensioners. Your pensioners are getting a basic pension, which is a form of basic income. But they're still going to think that they've deserved it because they worked their whole lives. And then you're going to tell these pensioners, well, actually, we're also going to give the same amount of money to a bunch of other people who, you know, like young kids just coming out of school and things like that. And they're going to go, hold on. That's a different ballgame, right? So, so we, you know, we have to be very, very careful how this is going to play out in reality. I'm not saying it's not going to work. I'm saying we shouldn't just assume it will work. So we need to, you know, we just don't know a lot of this stuff. So we need to be very careful. So I'm thinking, you know, the precariat does need solidarity, does need voice. And I'm not clear what it is that Biscayum can do in there. Right? That's the bit. Final slide and then I'm done. So if I'm right, and I apologize for being a bit pessimistic on this, and, and I should say that although I'm pessimistic on these specific arguments, I'm not saying basic income is a bad idea. I think basic income can do loads of stuff elsewhere, right? I'm just focusing on this very sort of thing, thing very specific thing. So, so one issue could be that we create an exit option, but we actually create another trap, another precarity trap, an exit trap in this case. So basic income could be useful, sure. It creates security, which is great in all sorts of ways. But the question is, can it create the sort of, the sort of next step of freedom, in some sense, from these labor market regulations through exit and bargaining? And I think it's not. I think exit options are weak. I think the access, you know, the, the sort of distribution of exit options is very unequal. And that's a problem. We need to think about that properly. I think the fragmentation and the lack of solidarity and the difficulties here is a serious problem as well. So you put all these things together, I think we still need a lot of work. And I personally, I have a lot of sympathy with you know, what someone like Guy Standing is writing about. But you know, in some sense, I'm thinking that we need a lot more evidence, very detailed evidence, how this, you know, nuts and bolts of how this stuff is really going to work, rather than having sort of, you know, big ideas and some, you know, sort of selecting out a couple of examples here and there, and then thinking that the basic income, we just map that onto it, and it's going to do all the work miraculously. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> like, I want to see this properly happening first, okay? That's it. Brilliant. That's me done. So I think we've probably got about five minutes of uh, questions. Oh. questions. Sorry, I did go on a bit longer than I, I Well, look, I, I mean, very, very interesting. And uh, it, it posed uh, way more questions in my mind than answers, which I think was what you were trying to achieve. Um, what, like, I have about 10 things here, and I can't get to all of them. But uh, the one thing, I suppose, maybe... Feel free to send them to me, by Yeah, I, I'll do that. I'll do that. Um, tax base yeah. is the starting point. Um, you can't fund anything without a tax base. You can't fund anything without tax. And you look at the precarious, and you say, um, OK, uh, cleaners working in hospitals, publicly funded hospitals, why are they, why have they become the precariat? Cleaners in universities, why have they become the precariat? Uh, academics in universities, why have they become the precariat? They become the precariat because uh, we don't have a tax base to fund public utilities, we, uh, universities, health service, and so on and so forth. So what we do is we start uh, public tendering processes, and it's about the lowest bidder getting the, the contract. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we can't, and we've no housing, and why, why haven't we housing? The same reason, we've no money to build houses. Um, we've no money to fix the roads, we've no money to do anything because we don't, we don't collect taxes. And interestingly, um, there is a tax in Ireland called Universal Social Charge, which is the only income tax in Ireland that nobody can escape from. And the left-wing parties were campaigning in the election to get rid of the universal social charge. These are the ones on the left. They're saying, get rid of the one income tax that the wealthy can't get out of. Right. You know? Is it a flat tax? Or it's a flat yeah. tax. Yeah. 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 No, it's, prog it's progressive. It's, it's, yeah, 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 it's it goes up. up. Yeah, 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 it goes up, but it's, yeah. it's a, you know. That's even worse. Yeah. Yeah. But there's no escape. This is the yeah, one yeah, tax yeah, there's yeah, no yeah, escape yeah. from. And you say, 
the people on the left, the, the radical left, as they would call themselves, are saying, get rid of the universal social charge. It's unfair. Only the ones who think that. Hmm? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, but they, they, this is how they self describe. You know, so these are, you know, um, so, like, I think there's a, there's a big problem here in terms of um, anything we're going to do. I mean, like, the welfare state solved a lot of these problems. Uh, communism solved a lot of these problems. But we're saying, throw those out, they don't work anymore. Should you solve the problem? Yeah. So, in a sense, we're, we're I, I remember, like, back in the 1980s, we were talking about pit and knit, where have they gone to? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there's a whole lot of them, like so. And the, the EU brought a policy there a few years ago, flex security. You know this one? So, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. you know, so we're 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 throwing around all these ideas, but we're we're still the elephant in the room. Nobody's talking about it. So obviously, as you can imagine, I mean, I mean, in, I mean, I fully take your point, but in a sense, it's uh, you know, I mean. There's many things around this basic income thing that I've bracketed in this very specific thing. And as you can imagine in the basic income debate, I mean, the funding of it is a huge thing, right? So, so there's a lot of talk about different ways of doing it. Partly, you know, and, and I mean, there's different scenarios, right? Partly it's replacing some of the existing schemes, including perhaps some of the tax uh, allowances and so on and so forth. That very much depends from country to country. Uh, you know, a lot of people are proposing, for example, that we need to have like extra, t you know, either, either basically, you know, um, um, add to the existing taxes or have special taxes, you know, like Tobin taxes and so on, green taxes. So, so there's a huge debate about the funding options, but I take your point. But in, in some ways, I mean, I'm not entirely sure what I would answer in, into this particular sort of scenario. Yeah. Which we don't anymore. Yeah. Uh, if we had universal health care, yeah. we had uh, free education uh, and so many other things and proper social welfare. Yeah. <laughs> we wouldn't be here. No, no, no. I, I agree. And I mean, to some extent, you know, I mean, I mean, in, in all fairness to Guy Standing, uh, you know, that is always has been the starting point of his sort of analysis as well. So in that, in that sense, we're all on the same thing. I kind of wanted to pick up the trade union thing that you were just saying because. So, so uh, kind of reading up this week on precariousness, I came across a paper that, so there is actually, you know, in uh, Guy Standing does this sort of awkward thing where he, he does this whole story and he sort of develops it basically very much disconnected from a lot of the research in actual labor market studies that is trying to operationalize and empirically measure shifts in precariousness over time. So I found a paper that's doing this for Finland and they basically, you know, after all their, you know, huge discussion of indicators and all models and so on and so forth, they basically find that Finland has moved from 11% precariousness to 13%, which is minimal, right? That's not much. The main reason why it hasn't gone more trade unions, the very thing that Guy Standing says we need to go away from, trade unions hugely relevant in the Scandinavian context to prevent people getting into wholesale precarity, right? We shouldn't underestimate this stuff. Okay, John, Ter very oh, sorry, John, like. John, John. Well, I mean, I have loads of things, but I know that the time is short, so I just wanted to say, first of all, I, I mean, I'm, I'm on the steering committee of Basic Income Ireland, and I recommend it. you look at our website, because one of the things we do is try to address it do what Jürgen said, is look at different categories of people and say, how does this basic income affect that relate to different people, right? And we also deal with some of these issues around funding and things like that. Right? Um, maybe I'll leave it at, at that, because I just want to get a plug in and uh, talk to you about it. Yeah. OK, we talked a lot yesterday about the neoliberal economy. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, in Finland, which is about to start, um, there is a huge push around activation. Um, every um, business group, every uh, large factory owner keeps on saying, and like, you know, you need a basic income because social welfare payments aren't that, they're not that floor for the, those who are most poor for whatever reason. Um, but they are arguing, no, we don't want a, an increase in the minimum wage because actually that. No, no, oh, yeah, well, right. I'm saying in really Ireland, sure. but, yeah. but I, I think it's true of a lot of neoliberal kind of economies where there is a push to, um, to decrease 
um, welfare payments, social receipts, minimum wage, um, on the basis that it deters people from taking up the low wage jobs that are there and employers don't want that. So I'm wondering how they would be able to cope at all with the radical exit because that's that's the one they use to frighten governments to say you're putting jobs at risk, um, you're supposed to be all about activation, you put up the minimum wage, you make it harder for us to and you know really a job is the way to, to yeah. live. Whereas like the radical exit is usually spoken of really pejoratively. So people don't see the value of volunteering or childcare or elder care or the fact that, that for some people it may not be physically or emotionally or mentally possible to hold down a part-time or a full-time job and it may not be what's good for them. Um, but, but that doesn't seem to matter to big employers, federations or, and they're the ones who mostly have ears of governments, they certainly do in our case. No, no. I, I mean, and I have to say, like all the, all the governments that are currently talking about, well, I guess the, well the Scottish will see, but uh, but the governments that are currently talking about doing the experiments or doing them, like Finland, Netherlands, and Canada. I mean, you know, they are not talking about you know changing the system and equality and anti-poverty and so on. It kind of features there a bit, but at the end of the day, basic income there is just regarded as a way to mainstream. The bottom layer and get rid of the you know the unemployment traps. So they basically just they've kind of come round to the idea that a basic income could just be a way of getting people into work, <laughs> you know. So so they don't. They, I mean, the Finnish government. The biggest mistake that people think is that the Finnish government somehow sees this as a utopian alternative to what we have. God no. I mean, the Finnish government is all about austerity and activation. They just have clocked on to the fact that this bottom layer basic income might just be the little tool that helps us with that. <laughs> so, you know, so it's totally been incorporated in that. So, so this, I mean, as I said before, norm, I mean, I, I've sort of bracketed the whole politics of it, but the politics of basic income is very interesting and very scary at the same time, right? So there's a lot of, we need to be very careful about it. So, and it all fits into these things that you're saying for sure. So, uh, okay, brilliant. Sure.